I'm now going to recognize Joe Cook Jr., please, with the next panel, the Big Companies panel. Please go ahead, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure everybody is sort of like on the back of Antonio's slide there, zoned out or zoomed <laughs> out. But, you know, uh, maybe we can wander through this next subject. What we're going to talk about as a group are the ideas behind the larger company's view of this subject, because in essence, they are charged with maintaining both the existing products that they have in the marketplace, as well as looking ahead to the future and being uh, uh, where Wayne Gretzky said, you got to win the hockey games, you got to sk skate to where the puck's going to be. And um, Antonio is going to cover that from the perspective of PepsiCo, then Stephen Goff is going to cover it from the perspective of um, Novo Nordisk, and then I'm going to come back and be, uh, provide a little bit of a perspective in between those two. But what you'll hear today is a discussion across the continuum from food all the way to medicine. And how, is the, how are those boundaries beginning to blur and how do we see larger companies addressing a larger space than just where they sit today? So uh, we're really, Pleased to have Antonio Tatarini with us. He is um, leading the charge inside PepsiCo, has a distinguished background. And Antonio, I'll turn it over to you and let you set, set up the conversation. I know you have a couple of slides, but you're more interested in the dialogue today, as am I. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joe. First of all, um, uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, to our friends uh, in Europe who are following, I guess, at this uh, late hour for that part of the world. Um, I wanted to thank you also, Thomas and uh, Zan, for inviting me back to this conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, if I can have the, the first uh, slide, I um, would like to introduce a couple of, um, of thoughts. Now, I've been, uh, I've been following the conversation uh, since the beginning this morning. Uh, so uh, through this first half day, I've been quite enriched again with the, uh, with the amount of uh, knowledge and science that has been deployed by the previous panels. Um, and my summary of it uh, entering this conversation, I don't know if you agree or not, Joe, is uh, sobering. Yes. Um, uh, that... Um, comprehensive and sobering. Comprehensive and sobering. I, I would agree with that. So what can an ex-clinical uh, scientist turned executive in a food and beverage company add to that conversation? So I will certainly not add to the science. I don't have that ambition. Uh, but what I will try to do is to perhaps add a couple of uh, practical points. Um, and so... This first slide, for example, uh, give me a thumbs, thumbs up if you see it, Joe. Yes, you got it. It's on. So it's, uh, uh, it's uh, perhaps a very obvious opening slide for, for uh, a conversation on aging uh, and even healthy aging, uh, as it offers a perspective uh, very well known to everybody who has been speaking before on the epidemiology of this program, of this problem. Uh, but why, and it's among other things, so I have uh, not even an excuse here, it's the same slide that I used last year uh, at the beginning of the same conversation. And I wanna drive a couple of, of uh, very uh, simple uh, points here. Number one, um, if we continue to have, as I hope, this conversation and this wonderful conference on metabicity for the next 10 years, this slide will still be uh, the same. Uh, the numbers will move slightly, but the message of the slide is the same. Uh, and why it's important from somebody speaking on behalf of an industry is that what industry does, as you said before, Joe, is to look at what are the big trends so that, they, that we can anticipate the evolution of the portfolio that we bring to the marketplace. And we at PepsiCo have landed on the conclusion 
that this is one of the, in fact, is the most durable epidemiological trend we are in front of. And so this is important because when a large organization lands on that conclusion, it means that idea is there because there is a belief that this trend will create a marketplace right. and therefore you have to shape your thinking towards uh, that marketplace. The second point that I would like to drive with this slide, and I think I made the same remark last year, so sorry, I'm a little bit repetitive, but sometimes repeating things uh, is useful is that the conversation, at least as I heard it this morning, is um, a little bit too Western-centric. Uh, and we know very well, those who follow this field, that there are certain nations, certain countries, certain parts of the world that are sitting and dealing with this issue as we speak. Here in this slide, the example of China, I could have provided the example of Japan. So I think at some point, and we certainly at PepsiCo are going in that direction, it will be good to enrich this conversation with a view that is not Western centric and see how other cultures are dealing with it. And the third thing that I would like to drive as an initial point of conversation with this slide is the job of uh, myself and my team in uh, PepsiCo, which is, a, um, as I hope everybody knows, a, a leader in the space of uh, convenience food and beverages, is to identify this durable trends um, that will create marketplaces and understand how they overlap or not with consumer trends. Because what we cater to is consumers. So that's a little bit of a pivoting from the conversations of this morning that have referred to as uh, the ultimate beneficiary of all of this thinking and all of this acting as a patient. No, we deal with consumers. So what does, and for us, the, the interconnection between epidemiology and consumer trends is, we think it's, it's a very important interface to explore. And so in this particular case, if I can have the next slide, which is also historical in nature as I used it last year as well. And some of the numbers are completely outdated here, but that's not the point. The point is that when you look at this problem with the lens of somebody who has to speak to a consumer, there are certain undeniable issues that you have to address. Uh, and one of the most important ones uh, is that at least in the Western world, people at the end of the month are already making trade-offs between having to put food on the table or having to buy medicines that are already available into the, uh, in the marketplace to treat the conditions that are associated with aging. And therefore, a very fundamental questions that we've only skirted uh, around um, some of the previous speakers have, have started to breach that uh, very important point is who is gonna pay for all of this? I mean, we know that pharmacological interventions for all the very good reasons and great reasons, and I have spent 12 years uh, as a drug developer, uh, when they come to the marketplace, they come with a significant cost um, and we're the societies and countries, including this one, are having already difficulty coping with treatments for associated conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dyslipidemia. We know the story very, very well. And so I say that because I think perhaps, as you were suggesting in, the, in your previous panel, Joe, this is the time to double up and support those, including the food and beverage industry, if this is done correctly, that will uh, try to approach this with a slightly different lens, which is the lens of functional ingredients and uh, uh, dietary supplements. So, and, and I know that that is always all, all often considered a lesser science. That's because the standards 
Uh, even the regulatory standards are a little bit less stringent than uh, what we discussed uh, in regards to approval of medicines. But to the point that you made in your previous panel, the problem is now, if we wait another 10, 20 years to get to a, an understanding of how to register uh, a drug for, um, uh, for health span, um, to a certain extent, we will have all uh, lost uh, a little bit the game that we're trying to play here. So is that play where, uh, when done well, functional ingredients and supplements come to the fore a little bit more, um, a shorter term uh, play? And then let me finish with my last slide to, uh, to launch this discussion, uh, which is, uh, I said the intersection between epidemiology and consumer wants and wishes. And so, again, by being here and, and giving this, this uh, my thoughts, uh, it, it's pretty clear that inside the company, we're giving some serious thoughts about this space. I said it last year that this has progressed to a couple of initiatives that will become more apparent in the next uh, few weeks and months. But again, when you look at it from a consumer point of view, now there is no prescriber. So people will have to adopt whatever solution we mark, uh, we bring to the marketplace by uh, buying it. Uh, and so in order for that to happen, you have to be able to speak about this very complex issues in a consumer friendly language and way. And I'm assuming I'm not gonna surprise anybody by saying that we know very profoundly that people don't like to be told that they're old, uh, let alone being uh, offered a solution for which they have to pay with their own dollar, dollars uh, and being told that they're old. So we have started to go a little bit deeper into the space. Um, and what we have discovered is, is two somewhat important things in the context of this discussion. Number one, that vitality is a much more acceptable idea uh, than, uh, than getting old and sick. And so how do you sustain vitality, which obviously um, links much better with the concept of health span. And also this concept of biological versus chronological age uh, and what can be done for that um, to be, uh, for that gap to exist whenever possible. But what's very interesting and I wanna offer for discussion to the listeners and to this panel is that both of these concepts are as relevant, if not more relevant, in the 35 to 50 uh, years of age category than they are in the over 65. And, and therefore, perhaps there is an opportunity here in the spirit of conversations that go along the lines of prevention to cater to groups of people um, that might benefit from whatever can be brought forward by functional ingredients and dietary supplements much earlier than uh, perhaps we had, we had anticipated. Um, and uh, just to conclude on, on uh, how you wanted to structure this discussion, Joe, it is pretty clear to me as an individual, but I have to say to us an as an organization as well, is that this conversation on health span and healthy aging will force inside these large organizations a strategic discussion on how much, first of all, if, and how much to cover the span of options yes. uh, that are illustrated at the bottom of this slide, all the way from indulgent foods. Let's not forget that people don't eat because of the functionality of food. They eat because they like what they eat for the most part. And this is very socially and culturally uh, 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 established. Uh, all the way through permissible nutrition, functional, dietary supplements, OTC, food as medicine, 
and I even left out of the spectrum actually drugs. But this will be, uh, so to speak, if you want to uh, talk in, in commercial terms, the, bug, the battleground, and it will challenge traditional industries to think more and more across the range. And so there might be competitive challenges, but there might be also opportunities for partnerships that have not been uh, seen uh, before. I think I'll, Antonio, I'll stop there. You have framed it well, and I, I this panel has really got a lot of potential avenues to go down. And you've set up very well the notion that this is a continuum across which we're likely to be in both conversation, in competition, and in collaboration, the big three. And so that we get the view from the other end, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephen Goff from Novo Nordisk, who is a leader in translating from a medicine to values that can walk backwards on the scale. So Stephen, uh, why don't you take it from here, try to See if you can wrap up around 335 or something like that, 332 or something, and then we'll, then we'll, uh, and then we'll have time for questions because I anticipate we're going to have questions here. Yep. Um, so th thanks very much, Joe. I hope you can, uh, you can hear me, uh, and I hope you've got my slides coming. as well. And your slides are coming up now, and they're on the screen. So you're Excellent. Good Great. So, um, so first of all, I, I would just like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this meeting to speak again. Um, it really is a great pleasure. If I could have my next slide, please. So um, at last year's meeting, uh, I left you really with this thought and the thought that GLP-1 um, as a treatment may provide some insights uh, into the, the common metabolic route in terms of metabesity. Um, and I, I emphasized last year that GLP-1-based therapies had been developed for diabetes and then uh, moving on to obesity. Uh, but that actually the benefits of this class of medicine goes well beyond glycemia and well, well beyond weight control. And that, as we can see from this slide, uh, has impacted on many systems around the body, including the cardiovascular system, um, such that we see protection from cardiovascular disease with GLP-1-based therapies. Uh, moving round, you can see benefits in terms of, or potential benefits in terms of the renal system or the kidneys. Um, we obviously, I've already mentioned the effects in terms of the pancreas and adip ad uh, adipose tissue from the point of view of diabetes and obesity, but also an impact on the central nervous system. And clearly this is one of the ways in which GLP-1 based therapies work in terms of weight loss with appetite suppression. But I also touched upon the potential um, of neuroprotection. And over the last 12 months, there's been an increase in data um, from uh, our own company and others showing the potential benefits that I described last year, not just the benefits I described last year, but new benefits, new benefits, for example, um, in terms of non-alcoholic uh, metabolic liver disease. And if I can move on to the next slide, please. And just two discussions, so if we can go back, just two points for discussion, uh, and okay, we'll stay with this slide. Just two points for discussion. Okay, so two points for discussion. One um, really is the, I, I, I mentioned the concept of neuroprotection. And I think the other thing that's important, and obviously in the light of what we've seen in the last six to 12 months with respect to COVID-19, the potential of uh, an antiviral benefit as well. So next slide, please. So I showed you this slide last year and I talked to the benefits or the fact that GLP-1 receptors are widely, exp widely expressed in the brain and that GLP-1 is involved in cognition um, and that GLP-1 is actually uh, now recognized as a neurotransmitter. And I also showed you data last year to show that liraglutide had the potential to prevent tau tangle development um, within the mouse brain, uh, within a mouse model um, of, uh, of dementia. Really raising the potential for this therapy in terms of Alzheimer's disease. And if I can have my next slide, please. This has evolved really in the last few months. And I, I just draw your attention to this article that was in Nature Communications um, within the last four to six weeks, highlighting the benefit of GLP-1 receptor agonists in the brain 
and its potential to have a positive effect in terms of blood-brain bar bar uh, barrier leakage um, associated with attenuation of microglial priming and really strengthening the argument that GLP-1-based therapies may well have a role in neurodegeneration. So that's one of the a beneficial role. That's one of the thoughts that I'd leave, like to leave you with. But the, the second, and clearly uh, highly topical at the moment, is COVID-19. So if I could have my next slide, please. There have been uh, multiple references at this meeting to COVID-19, and I'm sure there'll be further references as we move on throughout the meeting. But the real high risk groups for the development of severe illness, as we've all seen, is first of all, the elderly, um, and obviously those patients are people living in nursing homes, people with chronic disease, such as chronic lung disease, but importantly, from a metabesity point of view, patients with diabetes, patients with severe obesity, and patients with chronic kidney disease and liver disease. All of these conditions, all of these diseases are associated with a worse outcome if you're unfortunate enough to contract COVID-19. And I think that this really highlights the, the importance of these diseases, which are all typical um, of the aging process, obviously more common as we get older, and really brings together the link even further between cardiometabolism and to my mind, GLP-1, um, and also the aging process. And if I could have the next slide, please. You could ask how might all of this be linked? And we, we can discuss this in the panel discussion, but there was an excellent review earlier this year from Dan Drucker uh, from Canada, who looked at the pathophysiology of diabetes and obesity and how they might intersect with COVID-19 biology and really explored and discussed some shared pathways and mechanisms that lead to the development and treatment of type two diabetes. I mean, clearly cells within the lung and the gut are major sites for coronavirus en entry and inflammation. And these cells express some key proteins, such as ACE2 uh, and also DPP4, both of which may have a role in the development of type 2 diabetes. So, for example, we know that ACE2 and DPP4 are coronavirus receptors. And we know that ACE2 and DPP4 control inflammation and cardiometabolic pathology. Um, there's, there was a, a paper recently uh, in diabetes care, I think it was, within the last couple of weeks, looking at the potential benefits of citagliptin, a DPP-4 inhibitor, again, working on the Incretin uh, system uh, in terms of outcomes of COVID-19. And if I can have my next slide, please. So specifically um, in terms of GLP-1 uh, and a potential for an antiviral activity, uh, we have seen in recent years publications suggesting that GLP-1 receptor agonists like liraglutide may inhibit viral replication. And this is certainly a hot topic at the moment. And I think, um, if we, I, I think we should watch this space closely over the next few months. We're already hearing an, an, anecdotal reports that GLP-1-based therapies may well have a benefit in patients with, in, with diabetes and obesity uh, and coronavirus. But I think what we need to see is some real trial evidence, which I think may well emerge in the next few months, so we really need to watch this space. So I'm looking at my watch and hopefully I'm, I'm on time, Joe. So I'll just leave, I'll leave it at that. Um, and I just want to highlight the, the potential benefits of GLP-1-based therapies in age-related diseases, not just in terms of cardiometabolism, but also infections such as COVID-19. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. If I could have my slides up. So I'm gonna speak briefly about our experience at NewCert and try to integrate that in, ah, here we go, uh, integrate in with the concepts that both Antonio and Steven have introduced. One, from Antonio's point of view, he's looking at the base from where they are and how to develop a future view of addressing consumers' desires and needs using uh, knowledge and science Stephen has taken the position that the usual and, and very productive drug development process in where we identify a target, we develop drugs to act on that, and then we translate that into benefit, can potentially start moving into regions that are extensions of what the original um, thought process was and actually contribute to the same area. What I'd like to introduce now, next slide please, is our focus at NUSERT has been to say, 
what can we do with the science we already have sort of shown, and that is that we can enhance the existing function in the body uh, by using uh, leucine to activate the CERT-1 system. What can we do with already approved products so that we can take advantage of the extensive characterization of these compounds in both safety and uh, efficacy and extend their utility by activating a normal system in the body? And that, so that's what we've been about. And over the course of several years, we've done a lot of preclinical work, but we now have three um, uh, uh, clinical trials that demonstrate substantial uh, concurrence with our hypothesis that by adding leucine to agents that otherwise act in the same energy sensing uh, area, we can improve and promote their functionality and perhaps do so in a manner which would contribute to this common goal of addressing this uh, difficult uh, challenge. Next slide, please. So our basic hypothesis is what I stated, impaired insulin energy sensing contributes to all of this, these various pathophysiological roots in resulting end organ damage or uh, disease. And if we can simply focus on what we already know about the energy sensing system and tweak it a bit to make it more sensitive, uh, and perhaps more uh, healthy in it, its allocation of energy, we can contribute in a transitory nature to those uh, conditions and diseases. Next slide, please. So in three clinical trials, this is a composite slide showing results from three different slides, three different trials, but I wanna primarily focus on the combination of leucine, metformin, and sildenafil uh, leucine plus metformin at 500 milligrams BID and a very small dose of sildenafil, only one milligrams BID. And, 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 and we're using the sildenafil not because of its PDE5 inhibition, but because it contributes positively to ENOS. And how did somebody asked earlier, how did we get there? Pure luck. We were studying PDE4. Then we were studying PDE5s as possible contributors, and it turned out that sildenafil is the only one of the fills. Uh, Tadalafil and the others do not, do, this, do not have the same effect on ENOS, so it was serendipity. But the addition of both the AMPK agent metformin and ENOS agent sildenafil in combination with an activating level of leucine created a dual track improvement in the energy sensing, sensing uh, components. And as you see, over a 24 week period showed a reason, these are placebo weight adjusted weight gain changes, as you see weight loss in the upper left and a corresponding uh, examination of what did we see in weight change with those who had higher levels of baseline insulin as indicative of perhaps patients uh, subjects who were more insulin resistant, and we saw a pronounced and differential effect in weight loss. Then in subjects who presented with NAFLD fat, the liver fat greater than 15% and ALT greater than 50%, the green bar shows a substantial improvement in fat in the liver. And in addition, we showed a reduction in blood pressure. Next slide, please. So without going into the conversation about the utility of our clinical trial, I wanted to set it up as the possibility that we are gonna see a useful uh, combination of approaches that's gonna arise from, on the right-hand side of the central era, the drug development of prescription medicines that are going to become more useful as they move into more of a consumer mindset, and maybe on the other end, of the spectrum, the consumer mindset. And I, I did not show uh, the food end of that chain because so you could actually carry that arrow further out. And Antonio correctly identified that there's, it's a broader error than that. So our idea is to have a conversation around what are the components that need to be present for us to have a joint effort to carry across this continuum because quite frankly, we're all consumers and it, sometimes we're all patients. We're never singularly one of those. And as we think about solving this problem, it has to be 
available uh, widely. It has to be a lower cost than what would justify the development of a traditional med uh, re prescription medicine, at least that's my opinion. And it needs to be uh, very safe if we're going to produce uh, or, or claim an outcome that's going to affect people over a long period of time and be treated in large numbers. So with that, I'll uh, let's turn off the slides and we'll go and see, uh, first of all, do we have questions uh, from, let me check the questions here. Okay, uh, Antonio, there's one there. Do you see it? Uh, how can industry encourage the consumption of more whole foods? Yeah, I'm trying to read it. Would it be better if I read it to you real quickly then? Uh, no, that's fine. So, no, I got, I got the sense of, uh, okay. of the question. Well, of course, uh, and, uh, you know, the, um, the company that I represent is, has been uh, uh, really steadfast in, uh, in the past uh, decade to, in, in a massive effort to, to reformulate our portfolio um, to uh, make it more and more permissive and to, to introduce more positive nutrition. Um, and there are certain lines of our products that are well established uh, for that. Our uh, Quaker Oats line, uh, our uh, juices, uh, uh, Sabra and others. Um, now, uh, this reformulation efforts um, uh, are intense, but on a portfolio of over uh, 200 plus products, uh, they take uh, time and effort. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm proud to uh, be part of this organization is, is that the organization is unwavering in its commitment to continue that reformulation. Now the question becomes, uh, you know, again, the, uh, the, the place in that spectrum in which PepsiCo plays and has played for a long period of time is com indulgence and convenience. Uh, and the question is when you, as I said before, when you start this a strategic conversation of whether that is all of the spectrum that we are discussing uh, that you want to cover, then that becomes a, a conversation on uh, um, what is the innovation that you're going to move forward in order to upgrade your portfolio? Uh, and uh, uh, I feel pretty confident that um, what you will be seeing in the next uh, months and years ahead uh, will speak uh, very loudly of the strategic directions that we want to take. Thank you. I have a question for all of us to kind of think about, and that is, can the healthcare system really pay for the massive interventions needed to bring about healthy lifespan increase? And I'm particularly struck, Antonio, by your point that it, it, we have to think about both, both ends of the spectrum. The consumers are going to want to eat what is, um, they eat because they enjoy it. And, and we should not think that we are so smart as to say, well, this is the exact things you should eat and only eat this and you have no other choices. That, that's not a society in which most of us prefer to live. We want a, a certain amount of freedom. But, so we sometimes defer to saying, well, if the healthcare system will pay for it, I'll do it. Or if we have a choice, I can see the conflict here between the choice end and the paying end. So uh, Stephen, you got any comments you want to add on that? And then Antonio, and then I've got a follow-up question on that. Well, I think, I, mean, I think it's incumbent upon us to demonstrate the benefits, and it's certainly from a pharmacological point of view. We, we have to be able to demonstrate the benefits, uh, the health economic benefits. We need to be able to demonstrate the benefits in terms of societal impact, because that's what we're really talking about. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it, I think traditionally we have developed medicines where we've looked for a glycemic agent, we've looked for a weight loss agent, we've looked for something that addresses a specific problem in terms of a system. And I think we have to, and I think we are now looking beyond that because we now have medicines that provide a multitude of benefits. What we now have to say, we have to demonstrate, is how do these benefits then impact from a societal point of view? And I would turn the question round 
And so we have to put it in a situation where can we afford not to do it? Yeah. Because I believe that if we, can, if we can hit multiple systems and we can hit multiple uh, societal benefits, well, then it becomes a bigger question of this is what we need to do. Because what we need yeah. to do is what we need to keep people out of hospital. We need to keep people away from their healthcare professionals. Yeah. But it's incumbent upon all of us, including the pharmaceutical industry, to demonstrate those benefits. We need real world evidence. We need real world data. This, this goes beyond RCTs. And I think we touched on this last year at this meeting, how we, we need good real world evidence and real yeah. world data. It still yeah. needs to be prospective. It needs to be randomized. But we need to show multiple benefits that then lead to what I would believe are health economic benefits. Antonio, any add-on comments there? It's a, it's a very important question. Again, if you look at it from the perspective of the consumer and not of the patient, because when you talk about functional foods, mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself the question of why would somebody, us, want to consume something for a benefit that will come down the road uh, with no immediate satisfaction. In other words, you know, this uh, trying to create a disconnect between the enjoyment of eating and the benefit that we'll get from it will, I think, send us in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, my follow-on question was, are there emerging trends in the minds of millennials about life choices that may lead to a healthy, longer life? And if I go to Stephen's point about demonstrated benefits, uh, the millennials are of an age where there's no clinical trial that I can imagine designing that would show benefits to that group for living uh, because the consequences are so far in the future. So we can't simply assume, uh, we have to take a more consumer mindset to make sure we're addressing the whole spectrum of people across all age groups. And I, I don't see that as being uh, something that's necessarily easy to do because I think some of the mindsets that we read about millennials do not indicate they now yet res resonate with this as being important. Can I, can I slightly dissent with that and offer yeah, a view so that we I have- I said it in a provocative manner, hoping some- we have, we have developed internally. So as I said, we are in the business of anticipating trends. And when we look at things like uh, aging and, and obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular, it's difficult to find the, the hook for the consumer that thinks here and now, because these are things that will happen 15, 20 uh, years down the road. Right. Now, something that has dramatically changed with the, as a, as a, the unfortunate result of the COVID pandemic is people have realized that situations like unhealthy aging, such as this metabolism, have potentially a very acute consequence if uh, associated with uh, uh, an acute event like a, a respiratory infection. And, I, and, and we think that that will be a signal that will remain in the mind of the consumer and will change again durably, as I said before, the um, approach to uh, the, rel the relationship between nutrition and health. So that is something that we're watching very, very closely. The transition between a chronic threat to an acute threat and how that is going to change uh, consumer behavior. I'm looking for any fair weather clouds we can see in the middle of the storm. Uh, so I, I would just add to that, that I also, I mean, I, I think that I agree everything with what Antonio has said. Um, and on one hand, it is a long way off for our millennials to think, where will they, you know, what will it be like in 50 years time? So I'm sure what they're hoping for, at least another 50 years. But I, I mean, I think there's, there's another side to this. Um, and that's that, I think that the, the youngsters of today, the teenagers of today are much more in tune with our environment. They're much more in tune with society. And mm -hmm. I think that they're much more, I mean, I look back to when I was a child, you know, it, the environment wasn't as big an issue. The, the impact of what we do on our environment and on society wasn't as big an issue. And, and I learn a lot from the, youngster, the younger people around me now that they're much more focused on this. 
So I'm not saying it's not a long way off for them personally, but I think there's a greater awareness, a societal and environmental awareness. You know, that's a, that's a good point, but I think about how long it took from Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring to actually changing functional behavior, and maybe what one of our challenges is going to be to try to articulate the problems associated with not a dealing with these abnormal nature uh, uh, about metabesity in such a way that people know that it does matter what they do when they're 25 and 30 because their life habits they're building and they're going to be we can't turn to that uh, I, I'm excited and somebody wrote don't write them off I'm not writing off millennials my grandchildren tell me all the time about how more concerned they are about things and they want to live a, a better life the question is, are we offering them solutions? Can we offer them solutions that have both the hope and the promise of making a difference? And can that then transfect other components in our, in our society? That seems to me that's a job that requires more cooperation than competitiveness. So Stephen, do you think we can imagine more cooperation across the pharmaceutical space? And same thing for you, Antonio, among the food companies as we try to solve this more this larger problem it's not a single company issue i don't think but i i think we can i mean i'm always i'm an eternal optimist and i think we can you know i think we've seen through covid19 how people can come together i think when you see something that's a big enough challenge uh, then i'm not saying competition goes out of the window but at least collaboration and cooperation uh, come together and and i've seen that a lot in the last few months and i would like to think that Maybe it's changed our mindset a bit, and maybe we might see it a bit more over the coming months and years. Antonio, you got any final comments there before we yeah. wrap it up? Yeah, two, two, two thoughts, uh, just, uh, just uh, as a point of additional reflection. There is a cohort that we have been interested in for a long, long time, and it's a source of inspiration for how um, certain trends transfer out of them to the general population. And that's the uh, athletes. They're usually early adopters. They're very um, um, sensitive about their, their health. And so how this, this entire group of people is uh, reacting to the events that we're living uh, through is, is very uh, interesting. Another space that is emerging in our view and will be ripe for uh, not only collaboration across uh, multiple players in the food and beverage industry, but I think across industries, including pharma and food and beverage, is the space of personalized nutrition, mm -hmm. which translates in personalized uh, uh, medicine in the, in the pharma industry. Uh, this is central because ultimately one of the most, most fundamental cons uh, consumer question is, is this food or beverage good for me, regardless of everything else that I hear out there? And this is easier said than done, but in our um, analysis of the situation, this is one of the areas where pre-competitive coalitions might and I believe will be formed. So I, I'm, I think that's an excellent point because I think one of the things that's gonna help us if we reach agreement on what are the standards of both efficacy, quality, safety, and purity that we can point to that are not owned by any one company but owned collectively across the, both the scientific community, the regulatory community, and the commercial community to say, this meets those standards and therefore if i give you a promise of hope it is at least been vetted in a realistic way to say there's a chance that it actually is true the skeptics that i find when i talk with people is they don't really believe a lot of what's being promised and that's a a um, a retardant to adoption. And so I want to end on that note. I am more hopeful than some of my questions uh, suggested. And Thomas, I'll pass it back over to you for the next panel. Joe, thank you so much. And terrific panel. Thank you very much, Antonio and Stephen.